I, I want to take a few moments and because I want to get us back to the altar, but I've got to deliver this word of the Lord that's in my spirit today. It's called sustained revival, brokenness before God. Isaiah, speaking to the children of Israel, Isaiah 57, verse 15, he says, For thus saith the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a holy or a high and a holy place. And also with the contrite and lowly in spirit. In order to revive the spirit of the lowly. And to revive the heart of the contrite. Father, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. I pray that we would have ears to hear. And I pray that. Your word would be life-changing to us today. We receive it by faith in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, yeah. everybody said, yeah. give the Lord a mighty praise before you're seated. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Sustained revival, brokenness before God. Before I really get into the heart of the message, I need to explain a thing. And that, 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 first of all, that when you begin to deal with the subject of brokenness, spiritual brokenness, number one, understand the word brokenness itself is not in Scripture. But yet it is one of the most profound spiritual experiences that we have. Oh, there were, there's, there's much text that carry the weight of it, but the word itself is not found in Scripture. And when you mention the word brokenness or being broken, we must understand that there are two types of brokenness. The first type is the brokenness of life. And that we live in a broken world, and if you live in a broken world long enough, it will break you. Many people are born broken and they are born into broken circumstances. And brokenness is all around them. Matter of fact, if you just look at the world, brokenness is around all of us. Broken lives, broken dreams, broken relationships. The good news is God specializes in taking broken things and restores them until they are more valuable than when they were whole. That's not the brokenness I come to talk about today. If you're here this morning and you're broken, the good news is just let God touch you. Let the Spirit of God come upon you. Let His grace and His love surround you. Let Him pour healing oil into your broken place. He desires that you be restored in all things. But that's not what I've come to talk about. What I have come to talk about is brokenness before God. If we were to peruse the internet today for Christian content, we would find a plethora of product offering us help to be successful in all dimensions of life. We would find many tools and resources that empower us to overcome our hurts and our needs. They are right there, just a click away from receiving ministry and hope and renewal. Yet it seems with all of this access to revelation and to teaching and to truth and to tools, most of the church today is living a frustrated, defeated life. I come to preach a thing in this room. But deep down on the inside of all of us, there is this great desire 
to experience the reality of God's presence, to experience the reality of God's power. That's why some of you have not participated this morning, but you have stayed. And you have stayed because you sense his presence in this room. His presence is everything. And I think we in this church would agree that one of the greatest needs of the hour is that the hearts of humanity needs revival. But I'm concerned because I believe there are way too many, not enough voices, way too few who are not crying loud and sparing not. That brokenness is the only way to revival. I'm going to say it again. I'll say it differently, but I'll say it again. The only way to revival is through brokenness. You see, if we reach out to everything else to be made whole, if we reach out to other things to be revived, then we will stay broken. But when we understand it is this brokenness before God that brings wholeness, when we understand it's not about me becoming greater, it's about me becoming less. This brings us to our text this morning, and, 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 and God is speaking, obviously throughout the entire Bible and throughout the book of Isaiah, but here in our text, God is speaking through the prophet, and the prophet is calling God's people out of their idolatry. He's calling them out of their idolatry, and he's calling them into intimacy, He said, you tried all of those gods. I'm the one true God. We were together. You left me and you went after other gods. And you tried them and they left you. And you're dead and you're dry. And the only way to be revived is that you come to a place out of those, out of that idolatry and into a place of intimacy. See, what we see is they have been pursuing the low things instead of contending and conforming to the character of a high and a holy God. One of the things that stuck out to me is I began to dig deeper into this text was that God actually dwells in two places. This, Isaiah said he is a high God and he lives in a high and a holy place. He lives in a high and holy place. God said, I live in a high and a holy place. But I also dwell And I also live in a lowly place. God lives in two places. God is speaking here. And he's saying that Isaiah is seeing him and he said he is the high and exalted one. The one that lives forever or the one that lives in eternity whose name is holy. God lives in two places. He lives in a high and a holy place. But he lives in a low, contrite, broken place. He lives in the highest place that anyone could ever live. But he he also lives in a lowly place. You need to understand this, that there's a God that lives in a high and a holy place that also moves down into a low place. You see, Isaiah, this wasn't his first revelation of this exalted king. 
In Isaiah 6, 1, he said, in the year King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, the lofty and exalted one, with his train of his robe filling the temple. He said, I saw him seated on a throne, the high and the lofty one, the God that lives in a high and a holy place. He said, I saw him. I had a vision of the holy place where he lives and his train the train of his robe fills the temple. This is important because you have to understand where God lives. He lives in a high and he lives in a holy place. See the significance to Isaiah's vision in Isaiah 6 1 is that the long train symbolizes strength, symbolizes authority. You see, when, when a king in this time would take and defeat the country of another king, then, then the conquering king would take part of his robe and he would have it sewn to his robe. And, 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 and so the more his enemies, the more of his enemies that he had conquered, the longer his train became. And so we see when Isaiah saw him high and lifted up, when he saw him in a high and a holy place, he saw a massive train. He saw a massive train. You see why? Because God has never lost a battle. He has won every battle. He has conquered every king. Ah, in heaven and earth, none is a of him. He lives at a high, at a holy place. I come with some good news this morning and that is Jesus is always victorious. In heaven they are praising him all the time for his victories, his train filled the temple. One revivalist said revival in the simplest form is the life of Jesus poured into the human heart. The point I want to push on this morning is that we become, we become low places. When we become low places, then the victory of God fills us to overflowing, which moves out to others. This God that lives in two places, he's a high and holy God. He dwells in a high and holy place and he dwells in the low places. His victory, his triumph flows to the low place. Do you know why some people experience greater levels of the manifested presence of God this morning? Because water flows to the low places. Water always goes to the lowest place. When God finds a broken, empty place, he fills it with glory and power. I've got to preach this today. Before I get into... Do I, get, in, do I <laughs> get into the whole brokenness thing? I must deal with brokenness and revival. We define revival here at Fresh Start as the sustained presence and power of God in transformation, resulting in transformation. Brokenness is when God brings a people to a place that they understand they are utterly dependent upon God. It's not God in. It's just God. One theologian said we will never meet God in revival until we meet him first in brokenness. 
Charles Finney, the, 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 who is, is called the father of, of modern revivalism, said, he says, often, I went through the seasons of brokenness, so his appreciation, so I would have appreciation for grace and mercy. During the Welsh revival, one of, one of their themes was we, th there must be a bending before there can be a mending. You must understand that brokenness and revival go together. The crux of intimacy with God is genuine brokenness. The experience of brokenness is a sacred thing. It's not something you run around sharing with everyone. It's a, it's a sacred thing to where you, you bear your soul before God. Where all pretense must be left behind, all pride must be loosed. So the real crux of intimacy then is genuine brokenness. And genuine brokenness is like a magnet. And it draws heaven to us. You, see, you must understand that where there is brokenness, there is an attraction to the intense atmosphere of God's presence. To borrow a phrase from Duncan Campbell, well, the, the great revivalist of the Hebrews, uh, revival, he simply said, God came down. God came down. There is a place in brokenness. There's something about brokenness that draws the very presence of God. Tommy Tenney said it like this in his book, God's Favorite House. He said the Bible says before the great flood of Genesis, the Bible said the same day, the same day were all fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. And watch this. You must understand this. On the same day, get a picture. On the same day, talking about the great flood, on the same day, the fountains of the great deep Broke, were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. What I want you to see here is, 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 is on, on our way uh, to release a flood of God's presence. Then, then all, that one way to do this is to release a flood, a flood, a flood. That uh, To release a deluge is to make sure there's brokenness in the earth and openness in heaven. The flood came about because the deep places began to be broken up and to release a deluge and then the heavens opened up and there began to be the release of rain and the rain came down and the waters came up. I come to tell you something right now. Fresh Star Church, I'm not talking to nobody else today. Fresh Star Church, we need an outpouring. What God has been doing here in seven plus years began with an outpouring. And you know what? We need another outpouring. There needs to be a greater level of brokenness. See, what you have to understand that we have learned, outpourings are seasonal. They're seasonal. Almost every outpouring has an end date tag to it. Unless the outpouring turns into a revival, outpourings are seasonal, but they are necessary. They are necessary for revival to be sustainable. You see, outpourings are strategic. And they are strategic for renewing and refreshing the spirit of revival to be sustained. Again, Charles Finney, out of his writings, he, I think it's called the lectures of revival or something like that. And in that you will find that he talks about hindrances to revival. I find it interesting that, that, that there, were, there, was, there were several of them, but one of them is that revival may, and I'm reading, I'm quoting, that revival may be expected to cease when Christians lose the spirit of brotherly love. 
I, I thought that was interesting, especially for what Apostle Rick released over the house last week. But another way he says revival is hindered. He says a revival will decline and cease unless Christians, I will say revivalists, are frequently reconverted. I won't read this, watch this. By this, he says I mean, that revivalists in order to keep in the spirit of revival commonly need to be frequently convicted and humbled and broken down before God and reconverted. This is something which many do not understand. When we talk about Christians being reconverted. But the fact is that in a revival, the Christian's heart is liable to be crusted over. Loses exquisite relish for the divine things. His unction and his prevalence in prayer abates. And then, he must pass. Oh my gosh, make sure I got this right. And then he must be converted again. It is impossible to keep him in such a state as not to do injury to the work unless he passes through such a process every few days. <laughs> he says, I've never labored in revivals in company with anyone who would not keep in work and be fit to manage a revival continually who did not pass through the process of impossible, pass through the process of breaking down as often as once in two to three weeks. Revival declines commonly because it is found it impossible to make the church feel their guilt and their dependency so as to break down before God. It is important that ministers should understand this and learn how to break down the church and break themselves when they need it and, or else the Christian will soon become mechanical. Lose their forever and their power of prevailing prayer. It was the process which Peter passed when he denied the Savior. And by breaking down the Lord, prepare him for a great day of Pentecost. I was surprised a few years since to find the phrase breaking down was a stumbling block to certain ministers and professors of religion. They laid themselves open to the rebuke of administrating to Nicodemus. Art thou a master in Israel and knowest not these things? I am confident that until some know what is to be broken down, they will never do much for the cause of revival. I'm reading that because I want us to understand this, this is a man that spearheaded one of the greatest spiritual awakenings that our nation has ever seen. And he understood well that it is way too easy to lose our way down the path of revival. And he says the only way that we're going to be able to stay and sustain what God is doing and what God yet wants to do is there must be a people who live a life of brokenness. Brokenness on the earth creates openness in the heaven. I'm, do, I'm working on this because brokenness is the beginning of revival. You want to know what the price of revival is? We say this, we say it's everything. But do we even know what everything is? Brokenness of revival is a total renunciation of self and sin. You know you're coming into a place of revival when it causes us to bring all of our faults, our failures, our dysfunctions and acknowledge them before God in brokenness. Early when Jessica asked us if you need mercy, raise your hands. If you didn't raise your hands, my friend, you are not broken. Bro 
brokenness is coming to the end of oneself. Spiritual brokenness is the dying of self. Jesus said in his first message in Matthew 5, 3, that a broken man is a blessed man. Jesus came to introduce a whole new economy, a whole different way of thinking about life. In the Greek, there are two words that Jesus could have used to describe being poor. The first word suggests one that just gets by, someone that is, that, that is right at the poverty line, someone, but they're not doing well, but they're able to scrape things together. They're able to barely make it, but at least they're making it. But, but the other word which Jesus chose to use is a word, is a word defined as beggar. Beggar, one that is absolutely destitute, one that is abject in poverty, one that has no hope and left somebody steps in, reaches out their hand and pulls them up. They have no way of getting out of the realm that they are currently in. They have no way of getting out of the spiritual condition that they are in unless somebody reaches out and helps them up. You see, this is when you come. This is when you're at a broken place when there is absolutely no way that you can get yourself up, get yourself out, and God sums along and reaches into your broken place and pulls you up. What Jesus was saying there when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He was saying, blessed are the beggars. Those who know they're spiritual, spiritually destitute, bankrupt. They know there's absolutely no way they can survive without God. Without an intervention of mercy. Without an intervention of grace. You see, it is brokenness that God uses. So we will let go and surrender the things that keep us from experiencing more fully. Brokenness means we recognize what we have is not enough. Brokenness means there's more. I'm just talking about brokenness for a few minutes. Where does this begin, this brokenness? It begins with surrender. It's a simple message that surrender is giving control of our lives to God. That shouldn't be so hard to do. Just giving him everything. But, be, but really, we, we sometimes, we, we think we've given it all, all to him, but what we don't understand is that anything less than everything is rebellion. <laughs> Jesus never asked us for total surrender. He demanded it. He said, would you please give it to me? No, he said, you're going to give it to me. You gotta give it to me. I want who all you are, everything you are. I want every part of your life. I don't want you holding anything back. You see, that bothers us because we want Jesus to give us options, but there is no option. It's giving him everything or nothing. Why are you preaching? It's because I want the next thing. And the next thing demands greater brokenness. I just, you know, it's hard sometimes when you get into a place of brokenness and you get into a place with you and God and, 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 and you break through kind of this prayer thing that we all got going on and you really just get down to the bare knuckles and you're just really talking to God like I'm laying it all out, God. I'm laying everything out, God. I'm laying every, every doubt out. I'm laying every concern out. I'm laying every dysfunction out. I'm laying every sin out. I'm just laying it all out before you, God. This is who I am. Because you see, one thing it's hard to do is to deal with self in light of who he is. 
I can deal with myself in light of who you are, but when I have to deal with myself in light of who he is, him who sells, dwells in a high, in a holy place, the exalted one, I gotta come low before him. We know this. We're not, we're not immature. We're not new believers. We, we understand that, 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 that you, you can't be loyal to two gods. The hard thing for us to grasp is there is no neutral zone. If I choose not to give it all to him, it defaults to Satan. There's not a place in the middle that we would like to just put everything and kind of keep it there and I can get it when I want it and I can put it back on it. And, and no, 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 you, you, got to, you got to understand, if I just don't do anything, I, I'm not living in a neutral zone. I'm either in the realm of the kingdom where I have given it all or I am in a, I am in a dark place. I, I'm in a, I'm in a, oh, listen, God, just come to tell somebody right now, you got to shake yourself and get a reality check about where you are because where God wants to take you, is something you've never seen before. Can I preach this? The lack of surrender is a result of selfishness deep, deep in our character. I'm preaching to the church today. I'm preaching to revivalists today. I'm preaching to those that say we want revival. Do you really? The selfishness that goes deep in our character. It's robbing us of intimacy with Jesus. As well as our authority in ministry. Much of the church I'm concerned is satisfied with giving minimal to God and not the maximum. God, he began to push this deep into my spirit because I heard him say yesterday, it doesn't go unnoticed. <laughs> Isn't it something how sometimes we feel like we could just give him just enough and nobody notices. He said, heaven knows. Heaven is looking. Heaven is wondering. Is that all you can give me? We resist surrender because we are obsessed with controlling our lives. We struggle with submission because we love our sin. We resist surrender because we have not been broken. What does that mean, Pastor? That means our pride, our self sufficiency must be broken. Our lives of sin and self. must be broken. God's getting ready to do something in this room. Our love for pleasure and possessions must be broken. Everything not of Jesus must be broken. Because true brokenness produces holiness and humility. I'm talking about brokenness. Brokenness is the result of the awareness of personal guilt before God over our own sins. It's when we begin to seek 
This overwhelming need of a savior. It's when we come to the place where we release everything and we grab hold of Jesus for life. You know the revelation that came to me this week because I've preached on brokenness before. I, 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 I've studied brokenness before, but the thing that came to me this week is brokenness is not an experience. Brokenness is a choice. It is something we choose. We choose brokenness. We choose not to love ourselves more than others. We choose to put others in front of ourselves. We choose to die. I'm not always thinking about how does this affect me? How do I look in this? How does this make me look? I, I, I'm not always trying to get a platform and a microphone and a position. I'm not, I'm not looking for none of that. I just want to get before the Father and I want to come to a place of brokenness where I can surrender. See, surrender is when you're willing to do whatever God has asked you to do where he has put you right now even though you really don't want to be there. But you surrender, because it's not about what I want, it's about what he wants. <laughs> Brokenness is a choice. It's not a feeling, I feel broken. I haven't come to make you feel guilty. I really have it. But if there's a conviction of the Holy Ghost on you right now, you better respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit right now. It's not a feeling. It's a choice. I choose not to magnify myself. I choose. It's an act of my will. It's an act of your will. And this is the thing about it, so we might as well get used to it and you might as well receive the revelation today because it's not a one-time event. It's not like, oh, I'm dead and I'm good. No, we get up every morning alive and we gotta make a choice every day to die to self. We gotta make a choice, we gotta make a choice. We've got to learn as revivalists how to fall at the foot of a bloody cross and understand if it wasn't for the blood, I would have nothing, be nothing, it can do nothing. This is important because what God wants to establish and what God wants to release in and through this house as current concerning revival must have people that are broken who understand it's not about us and it's not even us. It's about our God and the glory of his kingdom. Yes? Hush. Oh, Brokenness, it, 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 it doesn't even require a crisis moment. Now, God can bring us to crisis moments. It's not about working through tragedy and, and trauma. No, no, no. That's the brokenness in the world. I'm talking about something in our spirit, man. This is no matter how long I've been in this thing, I need him. I need his mercy, I need his grace, I, I need his power, I need him. I don't wanna do it without him. I, I can't do it without him, and I don't wanna do it without him. Is anybody hearing this preacher up in this room right now? Brokenness is a lifestyle of agreeing with God about our true condition before him. That's a whole nother deal. Paul said we're, we're, we're foolish when we measure ourselves by ourselves. When we scan the audience this morning and say, you know, I'm not, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not too bad. 
You know, like the Pharisee and the publican and the peril that Jesus told. The, 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 the Pharisee came and the Pharisee came and gave his list of all the wonderful things that he had done and, and, and so, so, so to impress Jesus. But the publican, the sinner, the sinner wouldn't even lift up his eyes, wouldn't even dare look into the heavens, but got on his knees and beat his chest and said, God, can you have mercy on me? Have mercy on me. And Jesus said, who do you think was justified that day? Who do you think it was the one that beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me? Are you hearing what this preacher's talking about? Because Jesus said, you better understand this principle. He said, when he said this, he said, when you humble yourself, you shall be exalted. But if you exalt yourself, you shall be humbled. God is looking for a broken, contrite people that are not afraid to live in a lowly place. My prayer for us today is that we have an Isaiah 6 encounter. Isaiah 6 encounter. In the year King Uzziah died, or Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne lofty and exalted. This mighty, victorious, glorious king. His train of his robe filled the temple. Watch this. Then he said, the seraphims above him. Six wings. With two, they covered their face. With two, they covered their body. With two, they flew. And they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And he said, the foundation of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out. While the temple was filling with smoke, then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined. Does that not strike anyone? That the prophet... The first five chapters is saying, woe are you. Israel, woe are you. And then after he sees Jesus, after he has a revelation of God, he says, woe is me. Yeah, you don't you know, get it. The preacher was preaching. Woe is thee. And they were guilty of all kinds of stuff. They needed to hear that message. They needed to hear the call back. They needed to hear the prophetic heart of God. But then after he saw himself, he could no longer look at them and say, woe is you. But now he's saying, woe is me. Woe is me. Woe is me. Kind of like what happened to Peter. You know, when they had the massive catch of fish and he saw it and Peter ran and knelt down before Jesus and he said, oh, depart from me for I am a sinner. When's the last time you got so close to God you didn't think you belonged that close? What are you trying to do, preacher? I'm trying to get us closer. <sighs> Excuse me, but I'm feeling this strong. We must see God as he is. And the clearer he becomes, and the closer we get to him, obviously we see our deficits. Woe is me, he says, I am ruined, I am undone. Why did he say that? 
because he saw himself as he was. And this, Fresh Start Church, is where revival starts and it is sustained. When we see God for who he is. It starts with brokenness, repentance. Spurgeon said the word undone means to, to be pulled to pieces to the point of destruction. Do you feel like God's pulling you apart? Can I admit to you that I have felt like God has been pulling me apart? He said, I am undone. And the angel, I'm almost done. The angel flew to the altar and picked up what the Bible calls a living coal. The Revival Bible talks about this and it talks about the fact that a living coal, a living coal is a, is, is a coal that the blood of the sacrifice has dripped down on. And the angel went and picked up a living coal and he brought it and it touched his lips for he said, I am a man of what? Unclean lips. Now, for me to say that, oh, now, now this was the prophet. What did he use for God more than anything? His mouth. What was the most consecrated part of his life? His mouth. What was the thing that he was most confident in? His what was the thing that he think God would be okay with? He didn't take his broken place. He didn't take his wicked place. He, God shined the light on his strongest part of his character. And he said, I am a man of unclean lips. But the good news is the angel brought the living coal and he touched his lips with the fire and with the blood, with the power and with the purity, cleansed him and said, who will go for me? Who will speak for me? He said, Lord, here am I. Send me. He had to be burned. Before he could be blessed. Church, I just come to say we must be broken before we can be blessed. And the more we are broken, I'm almost done. The more we can be broken. And the more we are broken, the more we can be broken. This is why it's not a one time event. I'm, 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 it's seeming to me that maybe, maybe before we can have this next outpouring, God has brought us together this morning to come to a place of brokenness, that the brokenness in the earth will create openness in the heavens. Stand to your feet all over this room, and A.W. Tozer says this, and I close. He says, God rescue us by breaking us, by shattering our strength, and by wiping out our resistance. God rescue us by breaking us, by shattering our strength, and by wiping out our resistance. God needs a people who can handle his glory without being filled with pride. He needs a people that can be broken and bold. 
did you hear that? I'm not trying to get you to hang your head low. I'm not trying to get you to feel condemned and under a burden. I'm simply actually trying to get you to a place where his burden is light. I'm actually trying to get you to a place where you encounter. It doesn't take long. Uh, there have been times where I've had maybe, a, maybe just a couple of minutes where God just kind of came on me heavily and weighty. But as it came out of those moments, I came out with a new refreshing. I came out with a new place of power and anointing and authority. You're not hearing what I'm saying. You see, it sounds like I come to condemn, but I condemn no one. I just come to simply say this. Fresh Start Church, we are at a strategic place and God is wanting to do something in greater measure. And when God gets ready to do something in greater measure, he draws his church to a place of brokenness because water flows to the lowest places. Our God dwells in a high and holy place and he dwells in a low broken place.